Tracy, you uh, were in law enforcement for over 20 years. What's your reaction to Shaq's story? Community policing, is that the answer to helping this crisis that Chicago's facing? I think it wasn't just what Shaq's story said, is what you heard from the story, right? So we've heard community policing before. This is not new. Um, what the concern will be is what does it look like? Um, how is it different? There's exhaustion, I think, on both sides with community and police in regards to what are we going to do or what can we do in order to stem the violence that's happening in mostly black and brown communities. But I think what is right is you're going to have to do this from a multi sort of approach perspective. It's not just the relationship with community. There are communities that have not been invested in historically. Um, there are services, as I think it was said by McColl, that have been either defunded, underfunded, or no funds existing. So there's a lot of work that's going to have to be done on multiple levels. But this, again, unfortunately, and as heartbreaking as it is, this is not the first time we've seen this. Brittany, tomorrow is primary day for New York's mayoral race. Crime is the number one issue among Democrats. Those are the people voting. What does that say about the defund the police movement? Do people know what it means? Do they know what it is? Do they know what they want? So, Stephanie, I think it's important to begin with the simple fact that all of us, and I do mean all of us, want safer communities. Everyone wants and deserves mm -hmm. to be able to walk out of their home, walk freely on the street, play with their child and ensure that everyone is safe while doing mm -hmm. so. But what we also know to be true is that defunding the police is not just about taking money out of an institution that continues to prove ineffective. It's also about refunding the people. It's about ensuring that the services that people need to ensure safe communities from the ground up are actually being funded and resourced to their full capacity. I think that there are a lot of police unions and GOP operatives that would like for us to believe that this recent crime wave has everything to do with this idea of defunding the police. But guess what, Stephanie? The police haven't been defunded. You actually look at the 50 largest cities law enforcement spending as a share of the general expenditure in each of those cities actually rose slightly from 13.6% to 13.7%. And many of the cities that have talked about removing that money, like Minneapolis and Seattle, they've actually paused or slowed how they were thinking about moving that money. So this rising crime is not the fault of the movement. It's actually the fault of the police. And this has been our point all along. Why should we keep funding systems and institutions that keep rendering themselves ineffective? We should be talking about gun control, livable wages, fair housing, education. That's where we should be moving the money to, to ensure truly safe streets. Tracy, what do you think about that? So absolutely what we've been talking about for the last, what, my least 30 years, when you go into communities who need help, you can see that you're not necessarily the person, the person showing up in uniform is the one that they need. And we've had this conversation yet again, how do you provide and get services to those most in need? And that is investing in those communities and taking those services down to the ground where they belong. We have folks that have been involved in violence disruption for decades who are from the community and know the community and have been able to step in and provide wraparound services yet those groups are the ones that are least funded. So it is about where are you directing your resources? And again, as you know, social scientists will tell you, we don't need to study this over. We know where we, what we need to do and where we need to put those funds. And the question is, will we do that? We do need to keep cops on the job. Tracy, what is your take on this whole crowd control unit resigning in Portland? Well, it's something you're going to see, I think, across the country, especially this summer. You know, it starts to ramp up, <clears throat> excuse me. But what you're also seeing from a police perspective are folks that are exhausted. Those that are on that particular skirmish line are not the ones making the decisions. Typically, there is someone telling them either to engage, not engage, or to do something. And when you're caught in the middle of trying to figure out what is the best way to protect folks' First Amendment right and then be safe about it, that's where you're seeing the exhaustion. You're seeing officers, and this is not usually talked about, but you don't really hear from cops on the street. Typically, when you're having interviews or you're talking to someone else, you're talking to commanders or to chiefs, former chiefs, but the officers on the street, even officers of color, will tell you a completely different story. Oftentimes, they don't make the rules. They don't make the policies. They're being told to do something. And they, too, have 
I believe some of the most innovative solutions on how to do this. And that's what you're saying. You're seeing folks that have just gotten to their wits end and said, we don't know what else to do. And so it's unfortunate, but it's, you know, it's also an opportunity here to learn how, and maybe there's another way to have these conversations. And that it really is what sort of shines for us is when in these moments, there are opportunity and we have to begin to do those things and think about it. Although historically we may not have thought of it happening that way, but that's what we're going to have to do moving forward. Turn crisis into opportunity. That certainly takes will. Brittany, it has been a year since we saw protests sweep across this country. We just learned that more than half of the charges against looters in New York were dropped. Is that the right thing to do? Well, I think what's important to recognize, Stephanie, is that those protests <laughs> over the summer were largely peaceful. There was a narrative that there was widespread looting and violence. But much of that violence was actually started by people not who were there to protest on behalf of Black Lives Matter, but who were actually there to disrupt that scene. We know that white supremacists and in some cases, police officers themselves were there to start that violence. My question is whether or not we are prioritizing property or people. We need to recognize that these protests occurred not out of thin air, but because people were dying. And so ultimately, our solutions need to be oriented toward that. I think that it's really easy to run away with this narrative around rioting and looting, but the numbers show us that 97, 98% of these, uh, or sorry, rather it, protests in the 90 percentiles um, were actually peaceful. Um, they were nonviolent. They were intentional. They were disciplined. And that is the work that we need to continue to pay attention to and partner with.